Again, hold on, it's yet for some reason. Yeah, we're live. Um, for some reason, uh, Tika can't play. Uh, Welcome, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, as you join us today on Kumbukeni. Uh, today, I'm joined by Brother Milton and uh, Brother Colin. Again, I'm reaching you. My name is Adeso Jiginla. I'm reaching you from the belly of the beast, uh, the mother of empire, the heart of imperialism. And I will allow my co-host uh, to introduce themselves. Brother Milton. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Corporate Adeso Ji all the way from the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> Here in New York, Milton Alimadi. Greetings, sisters and brothers, comrades. Welcome to our open global university, Kumbukeni, where we combine our history and the blueprints that many of our ancestors have offered in the past to dealing with some of our contemporary challenges and solutions. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Karibuni, off to you, Brother Colin. Ah, uh, yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, comrades. Adesoji and Milton Almari. My name is Colin Benjamin. I am the managing editor at the Black Star News, along with Milton. And, um, you know, we we into all things Pan-African. So, I don't know, I guess we should just go into it. Yes, yes. Um, it's not uh, news to anyone. Uh, Gaddafi is gone. And um, in fact, he did go uh, 20th of October 2011. But the ripple effect from his removal, assassination, both, public, both political and physical, mm -hmm. suggests uh, we have a problem. And if we look on the political landscape of the continent of Africa right now, the trouble is still very much here, even though we're talking the odd decade now, if we look back. That's almost 12, 13 years, if my maths doesn't fail me, that he's been gone. And what exactly are we looking around? We have a continent that is in disarray mm -hmm. just with the removal of one man at the tip of the continent. Brother Milton, what would you say the assassination has brought forth, bearing in mind Gaddafi's philosophy? Okay, very good. I think it was a terrible and very significant blow against Africa and the African vision for Pan-African unity, uh, effective African independence, and African economic empowerment. The elimination of Gaddafi is comparable to removal of Kwame Nkrumah hmm. from power in 1966 by Ghanaian senior military and police officers working in conjunction with the United States Intelligence, Central Intelligence Agency, hmm. and working together with French and British intelligence as well. Nkrumah was removed because Nkrumah offered Africa the opportunity to enjoy true independence and sovereignty. And his argument was that, number one, we have to form a United States of Africa. Otherwise, they will continue using their superior economic military power to undermine us, to continue exporting our resources, and to push an agenda where African countries would be fighting amongst themselves. Hmm. And the second thing he said was that we have to industrialize. We cannot continue exporting just raw materials that they use in their factories and then sell back to us as much more expensive products. And then finally, he said, of course, we need a united government 
We need a united military command, and we need a uniform currency, a Pan-African currency. And these were actually the agenda that Gaddafi, toward the end of his life and his government, was actually pushing as well for Africa. He wanted an African currency that was backed by Libyan gold, and he already put aside more than $7 billion to finance this African dinar that he reportedly wanted to be, to be called the Afro dinar. And this, of course, would eliminate the dependency, particularly of the West African countries, on the CFA, which is linked to the French franc. That's what Gaddafi wanted to do. And then, of course, he was also promoting a Pan-African United States of Africa with one government, uh, one armed force, and one central command. Hmm. So he presented the kind of threat that Kwame Nkrumah presented to the West in the 1960s, the prospects of having a real United States of Africa. And of course, they didn't really like the way he had changed Libya after the revolution of 1969. Mm -hmm. when he took mm -hmm. power at the age of 27. Mm -hmm. As you know, Libya at that time was an ineffectual monarchy, yep. totally beholden to the West. The Western countries controlled all the oil in Libya, meaning they essentially controlled the economy as well. The illiteracy level was really high. It was a typical dependent, marginal, neo-colonial state. That's what Libya was. He seized power, he used the oil wealth to transform the economy, the culture, the education system, the healthcare, the infrastructure. And that, again, was exciting African independence. And of course, they didn't like that. And particularly, they didn't like the fact that he actually saw Libya, which is physically located as Africa, as a part of Africa, <laughs> unlike some of the North African governments that were essentially much more reoriented toward the Middle East politically, economically, culturally, and otherwise. He was not only identifying with Africa and the African continent, but using the immense financial resources of Libya to help other African countries. These, I think, in my estimation, were the essential reasons why NATO, the United States, and the West uh, determined and concluded that this is an opportunity to remove Gaddafi, who's been a thorn in our rear end for the longest time. So they used the, uh, the Arab Spring uprisings, mm. Tunisia and Egypt. And of course, when some echoes of uh, that uprising presented itself in Benghazi, in, in, in Libya, which of course was the seat of the monarchy. So it's not surprising that it was Very... that. They used that as an opportunity to swoop in with their own prior agenda to remove Gaddafi, and they succeeded. Hmm. Brother Colin, would you like to tell <laughs> um, <laughs> <call> the truth? <laughs> yeah, uh, so Brother Milton hit on a lot of things there. Um, so let me just say one or two things. Um, so my kind of way of looking at it to with Gaddafi was, I guess you could say, Africa's version of Fidel, in a sense, as well, only with the economic resources. Mm -hmm. The West, as we know, is always going to be against leaders who are about African unity. Milton just talked about the United States of Africa. And obviously, when, you know, Gaddafi was helping these, you know, various, like, you know, Nelson Mandela, for example, praised him, which caused a lot of consternation when, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mandela praised him. So Gaddafi put, you know, put the, Gaddafi kind of put the, his money where his mouth is. He, he, he helped so many countries. Right now, you know, Brother Adesoji, as you were alluding to, certain of the crises that's going on now, we know that he was, you know, he would employ a number of Africans from neighboring states during the conflict. They tried to claim that these people were mercenaries or whatever, just a lot of nonsense. 
But just now, Brother Milton mentioned Benghazi. And I want to actually say something else here, too. When, when the, before NATO went in and started bombing, right? Mm. When the conflict, the internal conflict was going on in Libya, mm -hmm. Gaddafi had made it known that these people in the Benghazi area, that they're terrorists. They, in, in mainstream media, they were making fun of him, scoffing at him, even in so-called progressive circles like MSN. Now, Milton probably remembered this because I was because I wrote about this. Yes, of course and, I do. And I was stunned. There, the um, the Joint Terrorism Center at West Point in New York in 2007, they obtained these what they call the Sinjar records, right? Mm. And Sinjar is this area in northern Iraq bordering Syria. The Sinjar records was basically a demographic recording of where the fighters were coming from. Now, initially, what made me interested in this was I kind of went through the Sinjar records, and I was stunned to find at the time that Saudi Arabia, as according to what a joint terrorism say in the Sinjar records, Saudi Arabia had the most fighters that were going into Iraq. Second only to this same area, Benghazi, and I think it's Darnesh or something, which mm -hmm, is uh, mm -hmm. an, yeah, right? Yep. I, at the time, I was more focused on, okay, how is it that an ally of the United States has so many people that, that not so many people have the, the most amount of the fighters going in to, to fight Iraq. the same, exactly. But in this particular context with Libya now, here's what's important. Even though Libya had, according to the Joint Center at West Point, this those same area around Benghazi had the second amount of fighters going, but as far as per capita, they were the highest. So the thing is, this Sinja report, basically, it backs up what Gaddafi said. Mm. Yep. And mm. so the thing of it is that it made me say to myself, there is no way that the, these government officials in the U.S. don't know this. Mm. So then so then you're faced with the reality, the realization that they are okay with these people who have blood on their hands. They have U.S. soldiers' blood on their hands. They are okay with letting them take over because we got to get this guy who's talking about bringing the gold dinar and he's talking about African satellite networks and this stuff. And when you think about that, you realize just, you know, I'm not going to curse or anything like that, but you realize just how, <laughs> just how effed up the whole thing is and how crooked these people are. And then, you know, one other thing to with this whole connection with Sarkozy, he being the one that pushed Hillary and she pushed Obama. Mm -hmm. But I came across some new stuff that was saying that Gaddafi had actually lent um, Sarkozy money to run for the presidency, right? And, yeah, so, he still, and so he still owed him. So it's kind of like, well, if we push him, we get him out. I don't yep. have to pay him anymore. <laughs> but then also this, I guess in their mind, the destabilizing effect that they would see that like Sarkozy in particular with, you know, the other French countries nearby, it's kind of like we get a couple birds with a stone born, gone. But but it, it was shocking to me that such an important document on those two fronts, you know, with, with, you know, all of these Saudi Arabian fighters going in and the connection with Saudi Arabia as being an ally, but also with with Libya, that has been virtually ignored. Because hmm. I've never seen on any any mainstream anything that they ever mentioned the same job. But it's I also know, I want to comment on what Brother Colin also said. Okay, go on. Um the Sarkozy loan, of course, Sarkozy ultimately kept denying it. He was tried for corruption a couple of years ago. 
and, and convicted. And of course, it was not so much uh, not having to pay the money, mm. but the revelation that he that, had that he to money him. would have been much more damaging. Much more, mm. uh, Gaddafi essentially became an enemy immediately after he came to power, when he nationalized the oil, uh, you know, and and them, of course, and also ejected the Italians. foreign military base from the country. Mm -hmm. But the other point also that Colin talked about, how the West actually enabled terrorism. They talk about, mm -hmm. oh, we're always fighting terrorism, fighting mm -hmm. that. It's absolute, complete nonsense. nonsense. They enable terrorism when it fits within their agenda. Mm -hmm. They have no qualms when it comes to the deaths of non-European people, you know, put it quite frankly. There was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, anybody interested can do the research, you know. Good thing with Google now, if you put the keywords, you can find it. Gaddafi had actually been housing, imprisoning detainees from Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo, the prison there. Yep. Had been, were, they were being repatriated to Libya because no country wanted to take that. See, because at one point he was really, and had essentially normalized relations with the West, right? Mm -hmm. So though that was not being widely reported, he had actually been taking these detainees. So these detainees were released by these insurgents that in many articles, and people can go back and look, the New York Times referred to them as freedom fighters, right? <laughs> so these freedom fighters, to use the word, to co use the word coined by the New York Times, mm. released these detainees from the prison. And some of them were interviewed in a Wall Street Journal article. And one of them said, we used to hate the United States 100%. Mm. But now with this new policy, I forget what percentage you we, said. We hate them a little less. I said, we only hate them 25%. <laughs> <laughs> and we laugh, but it was serious business because these are the people that, of course, once you, they came into power, you have seen, the whole world has seen what they have done uh, uh, to Libya. Mm -hmm. And one of the other thing in the background, of course, was a lot of these Western countries were hoping and salivating to control the oil mm -hmm. on the terms that existed before 1960. Right, correct. Yeah. That's what they were salivating over. And I think in our previous conversation, I mentioned this. There was an article in, uh, I think it was in Newsweek, and it actually mentioned the fact that even before these freedom fighters, once again, to go by the New York Times designation, before they came into power, they were allowed to start signing oil deals, deals yeah. with the uh, foreign oil companies. This is what they, they were doing in Libya. So, and, you know, and the rationale given was what? That they were going to prevent Gaddafi from, quote unquote, killing his own people, right? <laughs> so what was the solution to prevent Gaddafi from, quote, killing his own people? Libya was bombed 24-7 for eight months. Mm -hmm. And up to today, there's not been an accounting, not even by the United Nations, of how many Libyans were killed by the NATO uh, bombs. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Gaddafi's uh, former spokesman, Musa Ibrahim, in an interview on Red, which is online on, on YouTube, has claimed as many as 30,000 could have been killed. And he said there were 35,000 air raids. Okay, so his numbers are his numbers, so anybody can challenge the credibility, and they should. But on the other hand, you cannot deny that if you have 24-7 bombing for eight months, thousands of civilians must have been killed. Mm. The United Nations, you should still go out, even today, and start doing an accounting. Because the relatives of people that lost loved ones know the ones who are killed right. by the bombing. So an accurate accounting can still be done today, you know, even uh, 12 years after after that NATO uh, war on Libya. I mean, 
ju- just to underline what you gentlemen said, um, Gaddafi became a personal non grata on the 1st of September 1969 when he came to power. One, he destabilized the status quo, meaning he upstaged the Italians, which was their only, I think, uh, no, the, the richest colony in Africa at the time. Not only did he do that, he also pushed out the companies and about 20,000 Italians. You know, land was then given to Libyans and what have you. Someone else who wanted to try that in the early eight, early 90s, Mugabe, and we all know what happened to him. He didn't suffer a similar fate, but, you know, he had uh, geography to play with and he was surrounded by, you know, at least friends to a larger extent. Now, Gaddafi's coup might not have succeeded. And why was that? He was part of a movement called the Free Officers Movement. And they've been planning the coup for a year or so until Gaddafi had an accident. He was coming back at night and his car went, his Volkswagen B2, you know, mm. which is what was the premon- <laughs> the car of the time, mm. came off the ridge. And the plans for the coup, who was supposed to do what and where, was actually in the back of the B2. Mm. And because he's a high-ranking officer, they had to do investigations. And so the night the investigation was supposed to go ahead was the night they struck to get rid of King Idris the first. Since then, he came on the radars of the CIA, the MI6, and the French intelligence to say, this is not a guy we can toy with. And his policies ever since have highlighted the fact that he was going to center Africa as his main focus. We also have to understand Libya was part of the, um, what's it called? Was part of the Casablanca group, which wanted a clean break from the imperialists after the 60s independence. Now, where am I going with this? It is funny that uh, Brother Milton mentioned he fell during the Arab Spring. He actually didn't fall during the Arab Spring. He was pointed about by others who could have suffered a similar fate in the Arab Spring. The Saudis, the Bahrainis, even the Egyptians as a problem. In fact, the Arab League literally gave Gaddafi to them. Could I say one thing there real quick? Yeah, go on, go on. You see, right there, the thing is, he is a different leader than other Arab leaders, Right. They probably was like, what is he with this stuff with the Africans and um, unity and this and, that, this and that. Um, and, you know, we don't want no part of that because we've been abusing them too and still abusing them, right? So for, for from their standpoint, I mean, who knows how much they also had to do with helping the West to get rid of them, you know? like sure, Of course, know, they contributed you know, soldiers. Yeah. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Um you know, and again, moving the conversation forward, he he couldn't, they couldn't have laid a glove on him where he, did he not renounce his nuclear program? Which I think is key. The fact that he gave up his nuclear program opened him up. Of course. Yes. Opened him up to the West. And one other factor, one other major factor was the Iraq invasion. In 2003, Gaddafi was approached to help facilitate the easing of oil supply onto the market because the input from Iraq had been taken off the market, which shot up the price of oil to over $100 a bill. Who did that shimuzin? It was Prime Minister Tony Blair. He actually went to meet Gaddafi in in the desert. And when he okayed and everything was fine, and only for them to turn around and say, you know what? I think it's time we got rid of this person. <laughs> so when you talk about double dealing, uh-huh. it's not so much as they doing it. It's the fact that it's a it's a game plan that they've perfected. Yes. And we constantly see it play out. Uh-huh. 
and maybe due to lack of a memory, history, historical memory, or what have you, mm-hmm. we see the same play over and over again. Yes, absolutely. Right. Let me say one more thing. Let me just say one more thing. One yeah. more thing. Like, if you look at, like, say, what was done to Mohammed Mossadegh mm-hmm. in, 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 Iran. Um, in Iran, if you look at what happened to... Um, our uh, bands in Guatemala when the United Fruit was like, what is this guy? It's kind of like all of these political personalities did were trying to do pretty much the same thing. They were trying to say, you know what, you have been exploiting our resources, exploiting our people, hmm. and things got to change, right? Hmm. And mm-hmm. the majority of those dudes, they had to get overthrown, they got assassinated. It's only a few, and you know, you had Fidel, right? Who they couldn't quite get. So yeah, you're you're right. It's it's because any political person who dares to, you know, go against the business interest because it's the business interest that control these politicians, they're coming after you. They're consistent. Right? Yeah, they're coming after you. They're consistent. They use the same uh, template, the same blueprint. They know what they want, and they always fight for what they want. But the problem is we don't have enough consistency in terms of clearly identifying that in order to achieve what we want. These are the things that we must do. do. Yep. You know, whether it's fighting um, to usurp sovereignty in an oil-rich country, whether it's uh, a banana-rich company, like country, like Guatemala was, mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. Brother Colin just said, it's the same pattern. So we have to uh, agree on certain things that we also have to do. Mm. Right. True. So Brother so you mentioned a couple of uh, issues uh, on the nuclear, surrendering the nuclear mm-hmm. program, yes? Uh, and that is the reason why uh, North Korea will right. not surrender. Right, exactly. No <laughs> exactly. You negotiate whatever right. you offer. Right, they know what That's happened exactly. to Libya, exactly. and they'll never right. surrender that. That's and then, exactly in terms right. of uh, they, them trying to do the same thing to Mugabe, uh, they would have had it not been for South Africa, because mm. as you know, Tony Blair approached um, uh, was it Tony Blair or Cameron, one of the prime ministers, approached it was uh, Cameron several Mbeki. times mm-hmm. trying to get uh, Mbeki to sign on on the regime change agenda <laughs> and to go into Zimbabwe. And to his credit, whatever shortcomings people may lambast him for, he was a Pan-African and refused to go with that agenda. And I admire him tremendously uh, for that. You also mentioned the Arab League. Yes, the Arab League became the diplomatic cover uh, for the West to intervene because they totally forgot and and ruled as irrelevant whatever was coming out of the African Union. Mm. Removed Mm. The West removed Libya <laughs> physically, culturally, diplomatically from mm-hmm. Africa and said mm-hmm. this is an Arab League issue. So once the Arab League endorsed intervention by NATO, forget what the African Union did. Remember, the African Union um, came up with a plan, actually, right. uh, a plan for uh, free and open elections, elections that mm-hmm. Gaddafi would not have a role in organizing right, and conducting, would be internationally supervised and conducted. And Gaddafi agreed to that on one condition, that he be allowed to run. Run, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, he agreed, okay, I'll have nothing to supervise, to direct, or to announce the outcome, but I should be allowed to run. So when he said that, you know, the West could not accept <laughs> that, even though the African Union uh, accepted that. And remember, to me, the most humiliating aspect that demonstrated quite clearly the lack of African sovereignty up Mm. to date was when President Jacob Zuma had to get permission from Mm. NATO to fly to Libya. Because, of course, by that time, they imposed a no-fly zone. zone. So you have an African president or one of the premier African countries having to get permission from the neo-colonial colonial masters to Mm. go to another African country to try to resolve uh, this conflict. That to me was the best demonstration of the A lack of sovereignty. The fact that Africa and independence 
remains essentially on paper alone. Hmm. One I mean, question. I mean, I know we're going long at this part, but one question that I would ask, I would want to know what you brothers think. Um, do you think that our African leaders, you know, spoke out hard enough, turned enough stones, you know, um, and and we know that you know there were people who he helped like. Mussolini, who you know didn't seem to care. So I mean, what did he, I mean? You know, we just talked about the African Union. What do, you, what do you think about individual African leaders and and you know their voice? You know, during the conflict, do you think you know? Are you are we are we satisfied or? Are we? I don't understand the question. You mean with the current leadership we have? No, no, no. At no, that at time, at that time, at that time when the conflict was going on. Oh no, they were afraid. They were afraid. But look at look at it this way: South Africa ended up voting for the UN intervention. But South that, that was because they were forced to. And there was a story. You know, it's uh, very preposterous, but it's out there that when it was time to vote. Um, who was the U.S. Uh, U.N. ambassador at that time? Uh, Susan so, Rice. Susan Rice. Susan Rice. The South African ambassador <laughs> uh, wanted to be a no-show. And I don't know if this is a true story or not, but it would make sense. <laughs> and went uh, to the men's room and did not come out for a long time. But supposedly Susan Rice was waiting outside the door until he came out mm. and said, we are going to vote on this thing. Right. <laughs> Whether it's, you know, just metaphorical or not, to me, it's yeah. incredible. So at the end of the day, they voted for it as well. Yeah. And that's why the economic freedom fighters was always um, consistently denouncing uh, the ANC government for going along with that vote. And I would also want to add that, um, just to answer uh, Brother Collins' uh, question, most of the leaders at the time were so self-centered if you notice, all the leaders around him were pointing because they know the same problem exists at home. Right. And some of them also had a long-standing grudge with him based on the fact that he was one who supported revolutions wherever it comes from. You know, the mere idea that people want to... Right, stop and maybe he might support one against one another. Exactly. So Gaddafi was the man to go to. Gaddafi was like, okay, you need arms. Where do you want me to drop it? Mm. That was Gaddafi. So for them, it, it made sense if somebody else gets rid of him mm. before he becomes their problem. Their problem, right. Yeah, so... But they were afraid too. They were afraid of mm -hmm. what might happen. You know, they saw what the West was willing to do um, against this tiny country, a population of 5 million. And mm. they, you know, know that um, they don't want to be on the crosshairs mm. of the Western country. And they, they, the irony is that, the hypocrisy is that many of them, yes, even though Gaddafi uh, supported revolutionaries, he actually actually supported governments that were in place in almost all of these countries with yep. billions of dollars mm -hmm. in financing. So they wanted to have their cake and, and to it, eat it too. It is at the same time. And another shocking thing was between the rallying cry in Benghazi on the 12th of March, the voting at the UN at, on the 17th of March, the imposition of the no-fly zone on the 19th of March, if you notice the pattern, it suggests there was a predetermined outcome. Because those dates, so close together, and only for him to be removed on the 20th of October, will tell you they had a plan. They had a plan going. Definitely. And again, it ties in with what you said with regards to the oil thing. Maybe they was like, okay, if we remove him by this date, we will have the oil to play with by so-so date. So which brings me to the question. The guy is removed. What are we looking at? Brother Milton. Uh, today, of course... Uh... Libya is a total disaster, and the disaster spread to other uh, countries in the region, in North Africa, 
in, in, in West Africa. I remember seeing a Wall Street Journal article. It had an aerial photograph of a storage facility where Gaddafi uh, had stored uh, weapons and arms uh, for his army that were not yet being deployed. These are not even open in crates. Mm -hmm. The most sophisticated weapons. Um, and these are the weapons that became available to any militia group that wanted it. Mm -hmm. So it's not shocking that uh, conflict spread in many uh, West African countries, in North African countries, all the way to Central Africa, in fact. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the weapons, I'm sure, that are being used in the conflict as far as even in the Sudan, hmm. at South Sudan, uh, might have come from the arsenal that uh, became available uh, that Gaddafi's government had. Hmm. So that's been one of the consequences. Then, of course, look at Libya itself. All the achievements of the revolution being undone. You know, I went to Libya in 2010. And it was a very interesting story, and I'll try to summarize it very quickly. We had an office downtown on Wall Street, Black Star, right across from that uh, bronze statue of the bull. And one day I get a call, I pick up the phone. You know, we get so many calls every day, right? And somebody identifies himself as Mohammed El Dusi of Libyan Publishing Company. And I'm like, okay. He said, well, we like your book, uh, The Hearts of Darkness. That's before the new version of Manufacturing Hate. Uh, which, you know, I have a publisher for that, but The Hearts of Darkness had been self-published, how white writers created the racist image of Africa. And we would like to publish an Arabic version for North Africa and the Middle East. So we would like to negotiate with your contract. And I said, yeah, sure. He said, okay, you sound like you don't believe me. Should I send it in writing? I said, yes, and then I hung up. <laughs> uh, long story short, I, about a week later, I was in Tripoli negotiating the contract, you know, for this book. It was a real uh, proposal. And he was, in fact, head of the Libyan publishing company. Uh, so I, I fly there. And, you know, I like to say I'm very open-minded. I'm very critical of Western propaganda. Mm. I always like to take an independent position, right? But then when I was there, I realized that even though I consider myself to be open. Okay. I had been a little influenced by the bombardment with propaganda as well. And why do I say this? Because I was so surprised by the level of openness mm. that I saw. I hardly saw a police officer in Tripoli. And people might say, well, you were invited, you were taken around by a guard, but here's what I did actually. Yes, initially the first day I was taken around by a guard, shown around, taken to meet the publisher to start the contract negotiations. The second day, I got up very early, and I left my hotel before the driver and the guide came. And I walked the whole day observing by myself, because that's what journalists want to do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Myself, not to be shown around. I spoke to young Libyans. I saw the openness. I saw young women, college educated. Some, yes, of course, if they wanted, they had the option you know, to wear their traditional uh, veil. Some, if they did not want. They did not have to wear that. They wore uh, either, quote unquote, uh, Western attire or they wore traditional if they wanted. But all of them that I spoke with had a high level of education. And I interacted with them to probe, you know, the relations between the West and, uh, and their country. And most of them said, listen, they're just envious because of what we have in Libya hmm. and have in other North African countries or even in the Middle East. And in, in most African countries, of course, you know, we have free education up to university level. Uh, we have the, the state pays for the, your phone for the landline. You pay for your cell phone. When you about to get married, you get a grant. I think it was about $30,000 to start mm. off your new family. You can get a, a no interest loan for uh, a home, a private home. And that loan can be uh, and it's normally forgiven. Uh, if you lived in uh, uh, public uh, apartments, that one is paid for by the state. Uh, medical care is free. Uh, and they were listening to, at most of the cars that were driving around with young people, listening to Jay-Z, 
So the number of <laughs> openings, <yeah>, right? <laughs> even I found uh, surprising, mm. I'll be honest with you, even mm. though I thought I was a very open-minded person. Mm. Yes, so we negotiated the contract. They wanted to, uh, to print 20, 250,000 uh, copies. Mm. Of the book. But while I was there, I said, you know what? I started making some other suggestions to that, to them, the people I met with. I said, uh, because they actually asked me, at that time, they were really, really opening up and normalizing relations with the West. That's why it shows to you and it proves that what happened the following year uh, could not have been initially part of the plan. Hmm. But taking advantage of what started to happen in other North African countries that they said, okay, let's use this opportunity. It's a window, yeah. And pay back hmm. time. But let me just make one other point on this aspect. And so I suggested that I said, why don't you do, because they asked me, what else could they do in the US? They were a major investment fund. I said, why don't you do what Venezuela is doing? Venezuela is subsidizing the cost of fuel to low-income families in the Bronx. Why don't you do that to neighborhoods like in Harlem and bed -Stuy? Good idea. They, so they're writing that down. I said, what else? I said, why don't you offer scholarships to people in low-income uh, neighborhoods in the United States, scholarships uh, for university? Good idea. They are opening up their tourism at that time because they have some of the most spectacular ruins going back to mm. that times right cottage yeah it's beautiful mm. i went and i saw those as well mm -hmm. so why don't you open it up if you're going to have the tourism why don't you also look at uh uh tour companies that are owned by uh by uh, either african americans or latinos because rarely do they get into that type of business good idea all right so um my visit really showed me a part of libya that I'd only read about, but now I got to see with my eyes. And let me just say something quick, too. I was upset with Milton. <laughs> here's why, here's why, Adesoji, I was upset. The guy waits. I was working at this other place. The guy waits. Literally, I just come back from vacation. Oh, brother Colin, would you like to go to Libya with me? It's kind of like, dude, you should have asked me this like a week ago. Two weeks Wait a ago. Minute. I got asked just on the phone like that, and I had to go to following me. <laughs> you know, but um, no, but, but yeah, you know. but now, sadly, those people I met, I don't even know if they're still alive. Mm. Still alive. Mm. Mm. In any case, it's a very different type of it's now not the Libya, the revolution no. Libya. Now it's the NATO Libya. Mm. The NATO vision that NATO would prefer uh, for all African countries, yeah. uh, by the way. One of the one of the uh, problem that read his ugly head in the aftermath of this invasion has been the resurgence of the slave trade, mm. for which uh, an organization that will not be named got a present for a major scoop. I mean, it's the mind boggles that. Libya was one place where you could say in the north part of Africa, this problem was completely nipped in the bud. And now this invasion or total destruction of a society has opened the floodgates of this cancer of the African psyche to return. Yeah, well, Colin can talk about the prize itself and the, you know, and <laughs> oh, CNN. Boy. But let me also just quickly say on that issue hmm. of uh, uh, the trading of Africans, enslaving Africans once again. Um, you know, part of the ugliest part about the NATO war on Libya was the role of media, corporate media, oh. in this. We were very critical. We wrote many editorials about it. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing one interview, a, a BBC reporter interviewing Senator, the late Senator McCain. This, mm -hmm. These were his words verbatim. So, Senator, when are we going into Libya? Mm -hmm. We, the so called journalists, right. said, when are we going into Libya? He didn't say, when is the United States going? Right. When is NATO going? He said, when are we going? going into Libya with a straight face. Mm -hmm. That's how deep-seated this, uh, this, this concept Imperialist of, 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 of corporate media actually being another tool 
of Western governments is so embedded that he didn't even realize what he was saying. So of course, we were very critical. We wrote many editorials denouncing this, um, uh, the Western corporate uh, media role. Uh, I remember this one New York Times editorial that blasted NATO for not bombing Libya enough. Mm. And why would they say this? Because their rationale was that if we bomb much more, it would bring this war to a faster end. Mm. That was their logic. Do you think the New York Times would write an editorial like that if Libya was a U European country? Of course not. Hmm. You only write this in a country that is populated uh, by non-Europeans. And then one final point I, uh, I want to make is that one of our editorials, so now we know that we are definitely <laughs> in the uh, process, <laughs> uh, being very closely monitored by the establishment in this country. An editorial that we wrote um, in September 2011. And the editorial was very critical of the fact that the major corporate media, including the New York Times, were not, and CNN, were not covering the targeting of Libyans that look like uh, right. to, to donated, uh, uh, Libyans, particularly in the city of Tawaga, which was populated almost exclusively by people like look like us. Uh, I think the population was forty to 50,000. It was ethnically cleansed. Mm -hmm. mm. were burned, people were killed, many fled. They you know, just depopulated completely. And on the buildings, they would write stuff like uh, a brigade to, mm -hmm. uh, to cleanse the slaves right. from Libya. They write that on the wall. And to its credit, the Wall Street Journal wrote several articles about this. Uh, I remember because we wrote editorials actually pointing out that the uh, Wall Street Journal, fortunately, is writing uh, about this. Uh, the reporter's name is uh, Sam, uh, because I also mentioned this in my book, Dagger, and people can look up his articles. His last name is spelled D-A-G-H-E-R. Okay, so the final point, one editorial that we knew we were being now watch, right? We wrote an editorial calling on readers to call the New York Times, and we gave the phone number, ask them why you're not writing about the ethnically targeting of, you know, of, uh, mm -hmm. we call them black Libyans. Mm -hmm. And we said, call also the State Department, gave the phone number, called the uh, uh, NAACP, we gave the phone number, the Urban League, National Urban League, we gave the phone number, the White House, we gave the phone number. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next day, we could not access our website. And I write about this in my book as well, Manufacturing <laughs> Aid, How Africa Was Demonized mm. Western Media. We could not access our website. So we called our host, Network Solutions. They said they're having technical issues. Fine. The second day, the same problem. We can't get on our website. We get on there, we get a, like an error term, right? The third night, I woke up. You know, sometimes something just tells you something is going on. Mm. I woke up like 4 a.m. I called Network Solutions because they're 24-7, of course. I said, I don't believe you guys. I started getting the names of the people I spoke with, maybe two or three people. I don't believe that of the thousands and thousands of websites that you host, they're also not able to access their website for three days in a row. That's not possible. I didn't know what was going on, but I just didn't believe it. Go back to bed. I woke up couple of hours later, our website is back on live. Guess what? You can almost guess it. <laughs> that editorial, which was on the main page, calling on people to call and complain why they're not writing about or talking about uh, melanated Libyans being killed, has That's been wrong. deleted <laughs> from our website. So you have an establishment which is able to go to a private company hosting the website of a private media outlet Blocking them, number one, and then when we are not falling for that, you know, lies anymore, deleting that particular article that they mostly disagreed with. Think about that. Hmm. You know, we, I spoke to a lawyer, you know, if I ever do anything further with this, obviously, you know, I'll talk to him and see if he wants me to also reveal his name. And he said, yes, you can sue. But first of all, I have to tell you in the climate, the current climate, 
of jingoism and warmongering, I don't think you're going to get a sympathetic <laughs> judge or jury, number one. Number two, now that you have your website back and all your other articles are there and the damage seems to be minimal, if I were you, I would just move forward. And that is what we did. Mm. And that was not the first time articles have been deleted, deleted from our website because we didn't even know people could do that. Mm. But after that, we started noticing that the couple of articles that have been deleted. And very recently, we went through a major hack. Our website was disabled for almost two weeks. 26,000 articles deleted. But fortunately, a, a person building our new website had archived all these articles. Right now, the challenging we are going through because we are covering a lot of corruption in the courts here in New York City. Is to know which one. No proof, but we suspect that the ones behind it. <laughs> okay, so... There you go. Okay. Um, you often hear, you sp we are talking the media now. We often hear in the media the description, um, such and such country is a developing country, such and such is an underdeveloped country. In light of the bombing of Iraq, um, I said Iraq, wow. Iraq did suffer bombing as well, so it got visited with the same privileges. In light of the bombing of Libya, what would you say being so far that you you were there, what would be your sense that the infrastructure, the state of infrastructure in Libya, and how would you categorize now using Western media <laughs> matrix? Well, I think Colin wanted to also add about the CNN thing. Yeah, right. I mean, okay. it ties in, it well, ties in well, well, okay. Let me let me dispatch it re uh, real quick. Um, in the interest of full disclosure. <laughs> I studied at Long Island University in Brooklyn, which is really where the Polk Awards that Milton referenced in that CNN got for supposedly undercover work with the slave thing. Now, the thing of it is really, the truth of the matter is we probably, because I've been thinking, you know, maybe we should have entered that because we were writing about all those things from Jump Street. And I I personally remember getting attacked because in a couple of the stuff that I wrote, you know, I loved some criticism. We are too radical for that. President Obama, and there was there was famously some actor dude who, you know, sent some stuff attacking me. And that is so we from Jump Street was talking about all of that. And then in fact, last year I got into a little bit of a problem with a particular social media group which I won't mention, because I had posted a story regarding the, the migrant crisis. Well, it was it was both the migrant crisis as well as the, the slave markets that they have in Libya, right? And this particular social media company, they were, they were upset because I used two particular images in the post. One was a, a picture of a brother under duress with a gun to his head hmm. from one of these guys. The other was a picture of several sisters shackled together in one of those slave markets. And yeah. they sent me an email saying, we violated our, prep, our uh, policy, this and that. I had a back and forth with them. Um, towards the end, I said, you know, we're a media group. This is not some frivolous thing that we're doing. The last particular thing, they never responded. and just telling me, well, oh, if this is done again, we will disable you or whatever. But, um, you know, as far as the award, you know, it's like Milton said before, you know, the double standards in media too, right? Um, because because the other thing of it is, it was basically a media, and I'm not going to say blackout, whiteout, in, in terms of once these terrorists got in power and they start doing this stuff. Look at how many years that no kind of coverage at all. Mm. Right? Mm. All kind of stuff going on with the migrant crisis. You know, even the other day, you know, they were talking about this whole thing with the, um, these five people who died in this, this submarine thing. But there was, a, there was a boat that capsized around the same time and Something like thirty-five, I think, people, and there was you know, no coverage on that. But the five 
people who, you know, rich people, who, you know, it's so like, I mean, it's crazy. And I mean, I don't know, <laughs> maybe I should talk to some of my, because, you know, I studied under most of those professors who give out that same award. And I've had battles with a couple of them too. I mean, it, it goes to show the it goes to show the power of the media because uh, what you spoke to there was um, the boat mishap, not mishap actually, um, the boat disaster off the shores of Greece. Yes, and um, the irony of the two situations was where resources, what billions of dollars, was marshaled. Right. He was looking for five people. Five people, right. Where, wherein there was, as one of the victims who re got rescued from the boat's crisis, said you could see the ships, two mm -hmm. or three ships in the, in the horizon. In the dark, people were literally in the water drowning. Right. And they did nothing. Right. So, well, but... To, and most people won't know about that story, right? Uh, well, you know, right. that's, an, that's another thing, you know. It's... Right, but, but you could even go even further. During the uh, NATO war in Libya, and Colin, you may recall, there were a few stories out there of NATO planes actually attacking uh, some of these rickety boats that mm. uh, escape uh, from Libya and go into Europe. Hmm. And, you know, if they can do something like that, then, of course, it's not shocking that they will allow, ignore a story. Hmm. Because they were trying to say that, oh, he's got African mercenaries, you know, coming up to help and all this nonsense. That was a big part of, you know, if you recall, you know, they weren't talking about a, a lot of these people, or people who came here to work from these other countries. And it made it easier to for them to kill a lot of our people who were just there working. As well, well as, you know, you know, part of the, the, the major problem is like... Uh, the way media cover these uh, events, as if they're uh, uh, disconnected or unconnected mm -hmm. to each other. So the fact that you had a country with a strong functioning economy mm -hmm. that was employing tens of thousands of uh, fellow Africans from other countries, that's been completely eliminated now. So why would you be shocked that the level of desperation and people trying to make these exactly. voyages uh, go up? And there's also disconnected by the fact that many come from countries where you have programs that the governments in those countries are kicking people off their land. Just think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Kicking people off their land. And uh, when you have countries where, you know, you don't have social services, you don't have get like a food stamp like in this country, right? And mm -hmm. have access at least to, mm -hmm. you know, some level of nourishment. So you depend on your land to grow your food. So now you have in many of these countries people are being kicked off their land, and the land is being given to so-called investors, right, who want commercial farming to export the food to Europe, uh, to the Middle East. So now you've been kicked off your land. What are you going to do? Right. You have no other skills. Are you going to go in the city and get a job in the urban area? Mm. Of course not. There's a reason why people make these desperate voyages, even knowing that uh, many are dying as they attempt to cross, you know, uh, the sea, the, the and they still make that voyage. Because at the end of the day, uh, not most people would just want to lie there and die, right? Hmm. They want to try to do something uh, right. to preserve themselves and to sustain uh, their families. But in reading these articles, there's no discon there's no connection with the reasons behind them. Mm -hmm. And that is also why the intense focus then becomes, oh, look at these Africans mm -hmm. coming to take our jobs, right? right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the, tense, the level of hatred uh, just mm -hmm. becomes compounded um, as well. I mean, um, what would move someone to want to move from there from their country or place of birth would be a lack of resources, a lack of, you know, functionable, <clears throat> functioning infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That bombing alone, I right. mean, 
with the motivation by the press to right. go even right. harder. Right. Means right. And you asked that question. And you know what? I, I, you know, that question actually has, um, has, um, and here's something very interesting also. You may say, okay, well, he was a Qaddafi spokesperson, so he's expected to say that. But he said something very interesting. He said he took hundreds of journalists, mm -hmm. European, American, uh, African, to locations where infrastructure had been targeted, to locations where civilians have been targeted and killed. And he said they saw this with their own eyes. And he said something very interesting. He said, at the end of the day, he realized it's not so much the journalists, but it's the people that control right. the editorial it right. room, right. which, of course, is something I've been saying for a very long time. Mm -hmm. A journalist, per se, may not have a set agenda, right? right? I may say, I just want to be a good, because journalists like exposés. Yep. They like yep. exclusives, mm -hmm. right? They like to get credit for that, because mm -hmm. that's how normally the award is supposed to be given. Yep. So a journalist would like to break the story that, wait, the NATO bombing actually, in this one location, killed 100 civilians, and be the first to report about on, on that, right? And the fact that that is not getting in the papers, it means the gatekeepers are blocking that. So mm -hmm. even Musa realized that at some point, mm -hmm. that this might mm -hmm. not be the journalist with a personal agenda. Because why? He said it was so uniform, so consistent, that they always came to the same conclusion and always ignored the same stories, that he came to the conclusion that, no, this must be uh, the editorial uh, uh, gatekeepers. So that's mm -hmm. one point. The second point was that most of the... Um, uh, not most, but a lot of the construction had been done by uh, Chinese companies, right? Mm. So knowing how capital and capitalism works, I would not be surprised if a lot of the infrastructure damage was deliberately done uh, with the knowledge that since this re the, the post Qaddafi regime is going to be beholden to NATO, mm -hmm. okay, contracts. the contracts are going to go to NATO countries. Yeah. Right? So that, mm. of course, you can't prove this, but it makes reasonable sense for people that know how capital operates. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Brother Colin, do you have uh, something to add? No, I 100% I agree with that because we know that in the Iraq war, there was all yep. kinds of stories saying mm -hmm. similar things of, of you know, yeah, they, and then we know they had all the no bid contracts. And exactly. They they even flown in. They flown in, They they flew in cash mm. to pay yeah. contractors. Yeah. So so you know. So hmm. that's, that's you know. Wow. But but let me just point out maybe an irony. I don't know if you brothers will agree with me with this, but I've been thinking about it too, and it seems like some of the same terrorist forces that Gaddafi probably protected because I have a feeling that may, that some of those same guys at the Sinjar thing pointed out may have very well been, you know, ones who were involved with the Lockerbie thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it would be kind of like very ironic that, you know, in those years he kind of protected them because you know, I don't want to give over people to the West, you know. And then now those same people now, you know, decades later now, are part of the people who are not just overturning you, but taking your life. Absolutely. Hmm. You know, hmm. they're empowered. I mean, um, I have a friend that says, you know, he long time ago came to the conclusion that the West actually thrive on promoting kills destruction mm -hmm. and preventing other countries from becoming pot potential competitors. Mm -hmm. They do not want the emergence of another China, for example. You know, China was fine during the era when they could impose opium on China, you know, the opium wars, you know, but now that China is actually a global economic and political power, you cannot pick up an issue of the economist every week with several anti-China 
mm-hmm. policies. You know, I, I, t- I call them up on that. In fact, I tweet and I say, you know, even if you don't want to be seen as racist, you know, people would have no conclusion about to come to that conclusion. Just mm-hmm. read the articles of the last several weeks that you've been posting about China, you know? You know? Hmm. Let me uh, let me make one one other point here about the whole Lockerbie thing, right? With the Panam bombing, right? Yep. You so they made like a big big deal, you know, the terrorism and this and that. But the thing of it that's kind of ironic, right? Lockerbie was what eighty three. Uh, I think it was uh not, uh two foul. No, no, no. It was two. It was 98, 90, in 1988. I think it was 88. 88, okay. 88, 88. So here's the thing, though. In 76, you had a bombing of a Cuban airline. 11 minutes after it left the airport in Barbados, that it killed everybody on the plane, including entire Cuban fencing team. It killed about 11 Guyanese people, right? Two of the main people that were involved with that was Luis Posada Carreras and Orlando Bosch. These two people, the U.S. government, and and I should say that Carreras was involved in the Bay of Pigs Right, mm, mm, and then he had ended up. After a certain time, he had ended up apparently infiltrating Venezuelan um, intelligence apparatus, and because of the closeness between Venezuela and Trinidad, that particular plot, you know, they kind of used like a road through Trinidad to get to to Barbados. But anyway, the point is, both Posada. And um and Carillas. I mean Carillas and and um Bosch. Both of them were protected by the US government. Both of them died. Um I think Carillas was like 90 something and and Bosch should have been like 80, mid 80s, right? Without ever really having to pay for their crimes of blowing a plane out of the air and killing everybody, right? But because it, you know, it was a Cuban airliner, that's, you know, that's okay, apparently, right? So, you know, this is the kind of hypocrisy that you always going to see. And and um, both of those guys were involved in, other, in a bunch of other terroristic things. Carillas in 97, he did a series of bombing in hotels, including killing an Italian. And he pretty much, and he admitted it in a New York Times story as well. <laughs> right? But did he face justice in America? No. Yeah, because it's probably... You don't have to go that far. Look at the Nord Stream bombing. Pipeline, yeah. Mm. It's pipeline to carry natural mm. gas from Russia to Germany. Think about that. Mm. Who has the capability to blow up that pipeline? You know, these deep sea, deep sea explosion like that. You know, they've not been able to effectively deny the story by Seymour Hirsch, right? Right. That says the United States and Norway were involved in that. Even though they will say he's crazy, though. But... You know, that is the penultimate act. No, they will try and ignore him. Terrorism, mm. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, Gaddafi was such a um, polarizing figure for everyone that sat next to him to the point where they used that cover to malign him. And But what was his key philosophy, which was the fact that Africa has its resources. Why not use it mm-hmm. to create a vibrant intra-African economy, which was the goal, really. The goal was, you have that, I have this, let's trade. But I think 
he sort of spooked <laughs> the West into thinking. But I mean, the thing is, right? Africa is a breadbasket, right? And I always been. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so if so, they're not. They know from their perspective, mm. we can't allow these people to come and now control their own breadbasket and now dictate the terms, right? Just like earlier, we talking about how, you know, when Gaddafi basically threw them out and he nationalized all this stuff and he said, well, no, we're going to renegotiate the terms. But now this would be at a continental level, right? So mm. what would that mean for Europe, right? What would, you know, what would, what would that mean for, for you know, for, for the, the standard of living that they have been living all these years what would that mean so right. from mm. their perspective like no we can't let that it makes absolute sense 100 yeah. percent. if you put mm. yourself in the shoes of a, a capitalist in france you know yep, yep 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 yeah particularly france i think in a lot of these projects you know france has really been mm. you know inviting the united states a lot into it i don't mm. think Qaddafi was a priority to uh, barack obama no I at all, say, at all. Honestly, it wasn't if you read the initial statements, you know, very carefully, I don't think he, he had any plan. I think he was dragged into it, mm -hmm. but that does not uh, exonerate him at all. Ultimately, the buck stops with you as president of the United States. I think this was a Hillary Clinton agenda, yes. Yes. especially yes. because Hillary wanted to use this uh, as my tough on terrorism uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, mantra. Uh, and to get back on the... For when she was going to run, right. President. Right. You know, very callous. Remember when we can he died or whatever informed of Gaddafi being killed? Right. And she kind of cackled and said, You came, he uh, we saw he died, something right. like that. Yes. And then she rushed to Libya, and there's a very cringy photo that you can Google of her posting with these, as the New York Times referred to them, freedom fighters. Freedom fighters. A okay. photograph, right? But by the time she was running for election, Libya was had completely collapsed. And then what well, you know what she was saying? First of all, she never used that photograph again, right? Mm -hmm. It never came up. And then number two, what did she say? She said it was Obama's decision. All I did was give him advice. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> had Libya not collapsed, she would have said, I'm responsible for mm -hmm. the new Libya. Mm -hmm. And I went right. from the very beginning, very early, and here's my photograph. With right. the freedom fighters, you know. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a hundred percent. I'm gonna go to some of our uh, comments, some of our comments, and uh, try and bring some in to add to the conversation. I'll start with uh, hashtag We Out, and she says, "China won't play into their parasitical capitalist ideology." We'll probably explain why to speak to what Brother Milton was saying as to the vitriol in most of their write-ups on China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because China is not the China of the uh, pre-revolution. you know, revolution mm. When, you know, some people forget that as recently as the 19, uh, the early decades of the 20th century, uh, the U.S., Britain, they were still intervening and sending actually, you know, physical uh, uh, boots on the ground, hmm. you know, in China. And during the Chinese Revolution, of course, they were supporting uh, Chiang Kai-shek, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, China was transformed since the Chinese Revolution. China is now industrialized. Literacy rate is very high. China is not a World Bank IMF dependency mm -hmm. like every African mm -hmm. country is. China makes his decisions on its economy, what to produce, what unlike to produce. African countries, where the first priority of the economy is what do we produce to export to the outside mm. world? Can you imagine? Mm. That to me is the essence of colonialism. If your first question is not what should I produce to satisfy the needs of my people? Right. And then export becomes as a secondary Indeed. priority. And mm. that's part of the problem. Most of these countries don't produce to satisfy the needs of their of their citizens. And um, to add to that also is the fact that um, China controls its own communications. There's, right. a, there's, a, there's a video where 
a China Chinese spokesman who was lecturing the BBC, a BBC journalist, on the mantra of her own organization. Do you understand how your organization works? She was like, uh, uh, no, no, no. Do you understand that certain things that you put out are put out on the basis of this, and this is what it's supposed to do? Basically, you know, handing a, you know, as they would say, your proverbial behind on a plate to you in public. So she wasn't best pleased, but from time to time, people need to be told the barefaced truth as to what they're part of. Uh, Brother Colin, would you want to say anything? I mean, obviously, they know China is a rising power that's going to threaten, you know, their hegemonic kind of, you know, world control thing. So this is what, you know, I find it interesting, though, when I hear certain Americans that they will be complaining about China, 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 and maybe even a lot of these MAGA people. But they go to places like, they shop at places like Walmart, right? And you go in their house and, you know, it's like any, no, like any number of their appliances and all of that. Mm. Where where does it say made in, right? Mm. So so the whole thing is is that you know um, they see China rising and and uh, and of course they are very worried about what China is doing in Africa, which is why I think you know the whole thing with Africa right summit thing in in DC. <laughs> No, definitely. Yeah, my only yeah, as I've made on previous comment, I think uh, Africa-China relationship needs to be different in the sense that it should not just be about uh, raw resources from Africa to China. It should be a reset. It should yeah. be about transfer of technology. It should be mm. about building industries in Africa, and that is how China can actually really transfer, help transform Africa. So then Africa becomes more like China as well in terms of uh, its control over its production. Um, we have this from um, Az Majibuye. And he says, um, Simos Hesh Expose has uh, largely been buried. Right, yes. Because no yep. one in the West would uh, discuss right. it. Right. Yep, yep, yep. And you know, that's quite something like that's Sorry? quite something. Let me just say real quick. That's quite something when somebody of a stature of Seymour can do what? When somebody the stature of a Seymour Hirsch could write something like that and they just shut him out, given his stature. That's quite telling to in of itself, I think. Yep. Yeah, that's the point I wanted to make too. This is a guy that won the Pulitzer for exposing the My Lai massacre right. in Vietnam. So they cannot, you know, uh, really undermine his journalistic skills and credibility. Mm. It's a different one. But as uh, Colin just pointed out, it tells you the level of control. Not really control, but because uh, they have the choice, right? Uh, the corporate media. The level of how they're very willing to be uh, willing allies mm. of, of government. So it's it's interesting. Somebody could actually write a very interesting comparative book uh, because at least with Pravda, they didn't pretend, right? <laughs> they were an organ of the state during the Soviet Union. Okay. Publication, Pravda, right? Yeah. So your task would be how to read carefully and see what is really being said and not being said. And it's a skill you can develop, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. people actually did develop that skill. Even the Western intelligence agencies developed the skill of reading the Pravda propaganda and coming to reasonable conclusion that this is actually what's happening, right? With the Western corporate media, here's the danger. They themselves believe, what do, what's the word? They drink the Kool-Aid, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, because the public take it for granted that our free, independent, press, private, Western corporate media are not engaged in propaganda. So there's no need to read them carefully the way I would read a, 
uh, Pravda during the Soviet era, for example, right? I don't need to do that when I'm reading the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, or listening to CNN, right? Because our media do not engage in that type of practice. Mm. See? So people, by and large, surrender their critical you know, task or obligation and hmm. they swallow all this propaganda, right? Okay. So now there's a good uh, proportion who would you know, believe in what they're saying about Seymour Hirsch that all, oh, you know, this it's just a prank, right? Because mm -hmm. normally, if it's true, then the New York Times would say it's true. Right. A lot of people think that way, right? right? And they're forgetting the journalism that he did in the 1970s. Exactly. exactly. Well, let me say one quick thing. When Milton talked about will and allies, and when you said that, and I just looked it up quick, Operation Mockingbird, right, is a program that is within the CIA where they have recruited people and put them in different news organizations. Yep. I remember I remember when um, when I met Earl Caldwell and he talked about yep. tell people about who he is first. Earl Caldwell is a is a important journalist columnist. Um, you know he worked for a bunch of papers um, New York Times, Daily News. He's now a professor at um, Hampton University. Right. I think he right. became famous for refusing to disclose his source. Well, that's where I was going. That's okay. actually where I was going. <laughs> he, yeah, he, that's where I was going. Because he, I was, I actually was a part of a couple of students that asked for him, lobbied for him to come one year to LIU. And during the presentation, he talked about the fact that the Black Panthers had liked his particular side of journalism. So they gave him all this access and he was having all these scoops. And then he told us the story about how not so long afterwards, he starts getting these calls from, from the FBI. And then they're telling him that they want to see his notebook and this and that. What? Like, what are you talking about? I'm a journalist. No, no, no. And then he said he stopped taking the calls. And then he said at one point after it escalated, one of the persons that this was at the New York Times, who took the call. The person said to him, tell Caldwell, we're not playing. We want the info. So then he told us that he figured he had two options, run away to Canada or burn all his notes. And he decided to burn the notes. But then he told us afterwards that he realized to that it wasn't going to just be or hand us over your notebook, mm -hmm. that they were also going to try to turn it into like a double agent for them, right? So the other thing that, you know, some people should be aware of, there are people in there who, you know, you don't know what their connections is. So, mm. that, was, I did, so that came to me when Milton was talking about willing allies. When uh, Brother Milton was saying uh, it would make a good comparative analysis, you compared Pravda to, we're comparing Pravda to, yeah, to the corporate media. Corporate to, media, to okay. In United fact, States. You'll find out that the corporate media are much more dangerous, the Western corporate media, because people surrender their critical judgment and they allow themselves much more willingly to drink the Kool Aid because their presumption is that no. New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post do not engage in propaganda. propaganda. Okay. That is the danger. That's true. Um, I mean, it ties in with what uh, Declan uh, 19 says, which is the corporate media, mass media has buried the destruction of Nord Stream. And unfortunately, it's working yeah. because most colonial subjects because of most colonial subjects, I'm assuming in capitalist America, yep. we don't uh, we don't go beyond the surface. Right. Look, um, and this you know may sound like getting a, a, little, a little bit off track, but actually it is not. In my book, Manufacturing Hate, right? As you two have read the book, mm -hmm. I went to the New York Times archives and I found memos and letters, racist, the most offensive racist letters exchanged 
by reporters here in the New York Times headquarters and reporters they sent to Africa, right? Uh, referring to Africans as cannibals, these reporters and editors, uh, witch doctors, uh, but also even much more insidious, manufacturing incidents that did not occur in African countries <laughs> because they wanted it to conform with the quote unquote tribal perceptive, primitive perception of Africa. And the example, if you recall from the book, one yeah. example from Nigeria, <laughs> where a reporter, <laughs> William Garrison, I mean Lloyd Garrison, a descendant of William Lloyd Garrison, mm. is writing to his editor here in New York, saying, who put that reference to Nigerians dressed in Grasses. grass leaf skirt <laughs> in his article? Think about that. Mm -hmm. He didn't see it, he didn't write about it. But the New York Times ended up publishing something like that. How many people know about that incident? Mm. A few, right? Why? Because nobody would review this book. No major, major corporate media out there <laughs> anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Because that, well, that raises question, wait a minute, are you telling me that the New York Times actually manufactures stories mm -hmm. and puts it in the new newspaper purporting mm -hmm. to be news? Mm -hmm. And then they will start examining the past much more carefully, right? right. Mm -hmm. so in order to prevent that from happening, let's pretend this book was not published. In fact, mm -hmm. Even my own publisher is now is not pushing. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And I have no proof. But in the beginning, the first few months, I was getting royalty checks, right? Mm -hmm. I think somebody might have called the publisher. I'm not getting any royalty checks anymore. Mm -hmm. In fact, the next thing is for me to ask for the rights to revert back to me. Mm. And I give this as, as an example of how corporate media can stifle the mm -hmm. type of information that they don't want to get. Especially if it's critiquing them, right? Exactly. Yep. 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 And here's the best part. The New York Times wrote a long editorial. I think it was December 2021 or 2022. I think it's 2021. About the Kansas City Star. Mm. It issued a long apology for how it demonized African-American African citizens. Yep. In yep. The past. Mm hmm mm hmm so, okay, that's a good sign. So I wrote to the publisher. I said, now that you've done that, isn't it about time you do the same for your own coverage mm -hmm. of Africa? Oops. Have I got a response? Oops. No. Mm -hmm. In fact, <laughs> I have to praise Richard Prince, the publisher of Journalism, which is online, mm -hmm. for having the courage mm -hmm. to review the book. Mm. Right. And then, of course, the other person was Professor George Ntalaja mm. Nzongola of the University of North Carolina, history professor from the Congo. He's now actually the representative to the UN. And mm. then the other thing, I think the other one was from uh, Kirkus Review. But that's, a, that's about it. Mm. You know, the other corporate media, the one that I remember Ruben, who writes for the New York Times. And he gave me the name of an editor. He said, oh, I think he'll review it. Send it to mm. him. <laughs> and I did. I didn't even get an acknowledgement. <laughs> but remember, remember, too, after the coroner commission report about the riots, one of their famous phrases is the media is shockingly backward. And they use that particular phrase to talk about the disconnect between the media stories yep. and what were going on in black communities. But, you know, it's not like they're going to cover that either. So the media, they ain't going to cover anything right. that's critiquing them. Right. Mm -hmm. Because and they have the power. For this have kind of outlet. Otherwise, we would not even be having this type of conversation. No. See? No. So they, just shut, they will just shut it down and, yeah. Yes, okay. I mean, we're rolling up to the end of uh, another brilliant episode, um, if I might add. Um, Brother Colin, any famous last words? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, to take it back to Gaddafi, I think, you know, it's obviously is an understatement to say it's a disgrace. It was a crime mm. and crimes against humanity because it's not just removing him is all of the people that he killed and is all of the suffering that's going on now, not just 
by Libyans, but as we talked about earlier with other Africans, some of whom now can't get those jobs that they were getting, and some now who, in their trek mm. to go to the Mediterranean now, you're dealing with these, you know, these racist elements that have the blood of U.S. soldiers mm. on their hands, and, and how that has been just ignored and all of that. But I think Obviously, we know that we need to do whatever we could to encourage for the next set of generations, you know, to, to teach as much as we could about what Gaddafi was about. And, you know, to make sure that, oh, well, okay, moving forward, because we know that we need more people like Gaddafi, like Sakara, like Patrice Lumumba, right? Hmm. Yes, uh, brother. Milton? Well, yeah, I think uh, this uh, is a, 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 a very informative discussion, I think, uh, maybe of what we've been saying toward the end, makes it uh, maybe to do the need for a special focus on media in mm. one of our future episodes, you know, I think that would invite some good yeah, attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think also, uh, I think I agree with actually what uh, Musa Ibrahim said in a recent interview, that he sees some uh, tie-ins and echoes of what Gaddafi was doing with the resurgence of anti-French imperialism mm. by activists in West African countries, uh, particularly in Mali. In Mali, you know, they had the coup. I was very skeptical in the beginning. I said, unless it's like young officers wanting to emulate what Sankara did in Burkina Faso, I'm very skeptical because generally there have been reactionary coups, but it seems like in Mali they're listening to the voices of the youth on the ground, mm. um, and it seems like that is spreading in other West African countries, so that's an encouraging sign. Um, and I like the conversation that we're hearing about a borderless Africa in many African mm. countries now, including uh, the youth in South Africa, because that's what we, re we really need ultimately. Mm. And I think the older generation, if they resist uh, what the youth are demanding to really have sovereignty and to have a borderless Africa, I think they're at risk of being removed, actually. Mm. And you can't stop the march of history. And I think we're beginning to see signs of that. I would uh, say this. Um, I remember seeing Gaddafi as an 11-year-old uh, primary school kid because uh, the state house Nigeria at the time was next to my primary school Dodon Barracks mm. and so he was um, as with anyone he was in his military fatigue the, the mm. spectacle glasses you know the beret and everything you wanted to see a soldier and you saw we saw him and it was like okay so this is the man that everybody was talking about he moved as he spoke but mm. unfortunately that speaking you know rubbed some people the wrong way now we've lost another one the problem is africa has a way of forgetting what it needs to value mm. and so yes this so, brother, before you close up can i interject something quickly yes go on go on, go on go on when i went to libya in 2010 i told you about the day i went out to see for myself mm -hmm. i was mm -hmm. out all day came back in the evening to the hotel maybe after 7 p.m maybe 8 p.m and i found several messages for me uh, the driver and the guide had been looking for me all day and in fact and my host the publisher mm. a libyan publishing company had been looking for me too and it was only the next morning when i met again with the publishing guy mm -hmm. he said oh i know you're a journalist you went out to see for yourself because you probably were a bit skeptical, right? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, well, what was your observation? I said, to be honest, <laughs> I was surprised at the level of openness. It actually mm -hmm. okay. He said, okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. He said, but the second reason why we were looking for you and the, the many messages was that, I forget how they referred to him, maybe as the leader, I forgot the term they used for him. <clears throat> that's how he said the leader. I said, the leader was going to Mali but then there was the delay of about 40 minutes 
So I said, oh, let me use this 40 minute delay. Mm. This, uh, the author of, of the author. No. And they couldn't do it because you wasn't no, there. I could mm. hi to him. <laughs> mm. And of course, I was nowhere to be found. Found, right. Yeah. So that's why wow. I never got to meet him. <laughs> it just reminded me when you, you spoke about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he's uh he's a presence, he's a presence, he's okay. a presence. And yes, uh to our listeners, viewers, and those that will be listening later on Spotify, I also need to add that. Uh you could listen to us on Spotify every other Monday. Uh you can get the recording on Spotify and uh, listen as you work or as you take your do your normal chores and um is under the same name, Kumbukeni. Just enter Kumukeni into Spotify search engine and will come up also on Google Podcast. So Kumukeni is there. All the back episodes are there as well. So, and uh, thank you everyone for listening in and for coming in. Uh, as they say on this side of the world, it is off to the races and we shall see you some other time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so brothers, I 